Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this morning of Saturday the 5th of February. It is the most beautiful morning and the sun rising up over the wall, not there yet, but on the tower of the cathedral and giving us a sense of a really new dawn which will fit so well with the little lesson from 1 Samuel that we'll read a little bit later on. Uh, it's a, a charming story there and it stands all by itself but we'll come to that when we come to that point in our service. For the moment let's begin on this Saturday morning our morning prayers and be welcome wherever you are in the world bringing your own concerns and things which are troubling in your part of the world or in your community here uh, or uh, uh, in your own f uh, families. So all, all of those things we remember on this February the 5th as we begin our prayers. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. May Christ, the true, the only light, banish all darkness from our hearts and minds. Blessed are you, creator of all, to you be praise and glory forever. As your dawn renews the face of the earth, bringing light and life to all creation, may we rejoice in this day you have made. As we wake refreshed from the depths of sleep, open our eyes to behold your presence and strengthen our hands to do your will, that the world may rejoice and give you praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. And as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Perhaps it's a, a good thing for me before the psalm to say where we're sitting this morning because in a way there are reflections on the past few days. I'm sitting beside another yew tree here but at the same time I'm surrounded by signs of spring opening up here in this part of the garden. Uh, this bin beside me is very much going to be used when the rhubarb needs darkness to force it up from its, its uh, roots in, in terms of coming to be ready for the table, but it's not in use yet, though it is in use this morning for uh, this and Leo's breakfast here. But around you can see all kinds of signs of life with the new artichoke leaves coming out and also lots of bulbs coming up around me at my feet, daffodil bulbs uh, and uh, um, bluebell bulbs and even hyacinth bulbs which later on will be useful for decorating in the house itself and the lovely scent of the hyacinths. All these things around us on this really lovely morning as the sun just begins to show itself and may do so just here before we end our prayers this morning. Let's so say our psalm, which this morning is Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it, the compass of the world and all who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and set it firm upon the rivers of the deep. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord or who can rise up in his holy place? those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up their soul to an idol, nor sworn an oath to a lie, they shall receive a blessing from the Lord, a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord who is mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of Glory. 
It really is a global psalm. The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it, the compass of the world and all who dwell therein. And we have the seas and the rivers of the deep and everything about our planet is global here today and the life of the planet. Perhaps as a, a sad note to that, you will have seen maybe in your news in this part of the world that a huge bank of dead fish is appalling people off the Atlantic coast of France in the Bay of Biscay from a super trawler from which there is a, a, a sign of some fishing type of mistake or accident having happened, dropping its whole massive catch and that massive catch simply being dead in the water there uh, and uh, it's awakened people to the fact that such huge catches should not be being taken from there. The super trawler is already banned in Australian waters and I can see that it will soon be banned off European waters so that such catches can't happen and leave such tragedies in the sea. So let's um, go to our lesson which has a very cheerful note this morning, very different from yesterday but we are with the same characters uh, and we're deep in the trauma of the relationship between Saul and Samuel. And here in this little story, David plays a very different part still as a boy. So we come to verse 14 of chapter 16 of the first book of Samuel. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre and when the harmful spirit from God is upon you <clears throat> he will play it and you will be well. <clears throat> so Saul said to his servants provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered behold I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is skillful in playing, man of valour, man of war, prudent in speech, man of good presence, the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service and Saul loved him greatly and David became his armour bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse saying, Let David remain in my service for he has found favour in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took his lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. One can read that in a very ordinary way by saying that all this desperate stress with Samuel, all this tension has actually resulted in periods of, of terrible depression. Come on, Tiger. Come. If you come now. Okay. Come up. Come on. Up you come. Good boy. Uh, periods of terrible mental depression for the king which come upon him. And what we see here is a little story which has survived almost by itself, like a little capsule put in. 
But from it, we get a different image of David. And Saul already knows that he is the one who looks after the sheep. He says that in his message to Jesse. This is a message from the king. So Jesse, when he sends his youngest son, who now is beginning to grow into the stature of the other seven brothers who had impressed Samuel physically the day before, he sends his youngest son with gifts for the king. And David comes probably with an enormous amount of trepidation. But he's shepherding the sheep and is known also as a skilled player upon the lyre, a simple form of harp. And from this little story comes another image of David as a musician and as the foundation of the psalms of David, as we call them. So that the shepherd's psalm, 23, which is just before the psalm we read this morning, has become one of the most beloved of all psalms. If I turn the page back, it does us good to read it. I'm reading it in this version from Daily Prayer. You will know it in many different versions and in hymn tunes and all sorts of other ways. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore can I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He shall refresh my soul and guide me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup shall be full. Surely goodness and loving mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for ever. As I say, one of the most beloved of all psalms, and really associated with David, and there's that sentence there about anointing with oil, which Samuel has already done, as we saw in our lesson yesterday. But that anointing as the king for the future is not going to be the happiest of anointings for David to start with. But we have one or two stories left to tell, which have been left over from his earlier days, and we'll come to those. But this morning, we rejoice in this story, which associates David with the whole book of the Psalms, so that his inspiration is seen as a musician, and obviously a singer too, in, in that book of the Psalms, which has always been the root of all our daily offices and the way in which we approach worship each day. Sentences from those Psalms of David, as they're traditionally called. Also, it, it reminds us of the traditional association of shepherds with simple instruments of music, pipes and lyres like this, for singing to one another and singing for their own enjoyment is one of the pastoral images well, well back in all uh, literature of, of shepherds. And also the simplicity of the shepherd boy coming to the king is reflected so often in our crib scenes, where in traditional crib scenes, a young boy and often a young girl are there <coughs> with a lamb, or, but standing slightly on the outskirts rather as David had been when Samuel went to anoint and began to look at the brothers and say, surely it must be one of those. And then, is there nobody else? And Jesse saying, well, there is one. He's out keeping the sheep, shepherding the sheep. There's one image of David. And today, here's another. The simplicity of the instrument, of the harp, but at the same time, the ability of music to refresh the soul. Now, you and I don't need to be told that. 
And nor do we need to be told, because we know it deep within us, that every form of worship has music right through it, of different sorts, in different cultures, but the ability to sing and to listen to singing and listen to music and for us to listen to the psalms being sung is in a place like this a daily refreshment for ourselves often nowadays of course we can hear recordings of these things whenever we want but it never ever ever takes the place of making music oneself because when we sing there is something beautiful going on within us. Matters not how we sing or what skills we have. Somehow, the desire to sing, especially in community, but often by oneself, and also the feelings evoked by music when you hear it and you know it, and the words or the meaning of the music or the association with something that's gone on in your life before suddenly wakens up. How often have I mentioned hymns or read hymns uh, in the, the, the uh, morning worship of all of us and we've had messages back saying that hymn really touched me because and then a story attached in some way or another. A multitude of stories from sadness and joy and from sudden pleasure and sudden spiritual awakening as well. So that in that way um, we find that music is, is helping us. And <clears throat> here we see David helping the king by simply playing and singing at times when the real um, depression comes over Saul and he feels that he needs a, a refreshment a revival of his spirits. So let's give thanks for all of that this morning and remember that this is the David, the royal line of David, the house of Judah and the genealogy from which the anointed one, our Lord, will be born. But those images are images that Jesus himself treasured. I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep. And so often those images are carried on. That lovely Psalm 23 speaks of that to us instantly. It joins the old covenant with the new covenant and the anointing does exactly the same. So that we have here David the shepherd king, but also David the musician who is thrilling the king and his court with music and those courtiers around the king, those servants of the king, knew that Saul would be refreshed by hearing the music of the harp and perhaps by hearing David's voice singing. Um, there's a, a, a lovely long hymn which isn't sung so much now, Jerusalem my happy home, name ever dear to me, and in that there are descriptions of the heavenly Jerusalem and one of the couplets uh, in that hymn, which is a delightful couplet, there David stands with harp in hand, the master of the choir. Well, it's a lovely image of the, the eternal city and it's always amused me uh, uh, when I have a, a director of music called David, which we do now and we did before. And in all my Tisbury years, I had a director of music who was a, a skilled musician on the organ and in choirs. Uh, and the, the David uh, there was, was also the master of the choir. So it amuses me when we can say that. So um, then let's go on now with our reflections because there is a date today which joins all sorts of things here together. It's the day, February the 5th, in 1837, when the American evangelist Dwight L. Moody was born. And Dwight Moody had a vocation to refresh people's spirits with his words and to teach them the truths of the gospel in the most simple ways. And at first, this was shown in an enormous desire to use his resources and to use his energies and his skills as a teacher in Sunday schools for people growing up. 
though in fact the parents often would learn so much as so often happens a child's lesson when it's being listened to inadvertently if it's simply done is able to teach the faith in a great way but here was here was Moody and he set up his his real base in Chicago and we're talking now in the late 1860s and uh, up to 1870 and then in 1871 things were going along well with the Sunday School movement uh, but at an international Sunday School convention in Indianapolis in June 1871 Dwight L. Moody met Ira D. Sankey, a musician, a singer, a singer of gospel songs and things, I will say things took off, but let's just pause a moment. He realised that Sankey's singing refreshed the people he was speaking to in a particular way which made them more avid to hear what was going to come next, but also somehow joined them to gospel stories by the tunes that were being sung and by the voice that was singing it. And oftentimes if the voice had a chorus there, they would begin to join in. So that music began from Moody and Sankey together, words and music. Moody wasn't the hymn writer in words. Moody was the teacher, the offering of the good news, the evangel, the gospel to the people. And now with Sankey, suddenly things began to take off. But first something catastrophic happened. Moody was invited, uh, sorry, Moody invited Sankey to join him in Chicago in this great mission with all the resources of his church and everything else that was going on there, the school, the Sunday schools and so on. This was June 1871. In October 1871, in a huge conflagration, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed a huge section of the city of Chicago. There was great loss of life. It must have been a terrifying experience and everything of the resources of, of uh, Dwight Moody and he, he had many resources were destroyed and during that fire Sankey uh, got into a boat to save himself really and rowed himself out onto Lake Michigan and looked back and saw the city and all their resources burning. And afterwards, uh, he thought, well, that was, you know, a nice try, but uh, we'll, obviously we can't go on after that. And uh, he then went back home uh, and Moody summoned him again <coughs> and said, we've lost resources, but maybe it's a, a new way of, of going ahead. So they began without those resources to travel and Moody would preach and Sankey would sing and he sang not at first his own tunes that came later but he sang to stadia of 2,000 to 4,000 people. How they got their voices across I've no idea because nowadays we're so used to electric mechanisms of even when you've got a, a, a crowd of 200 or something of that sort, you can make your voice heard. Uh, if the, the cathedral, if it was filled and I had no mechanism to, to speak, I don't know how many of the people will be hearing what I was saying, even from the pulpit in the cathedral. Out in the open air, you would have to be using your voice hugely for the numbers that came and I always think of Jesus uh, in amphitheatres like the lakeside sitting in the boat speaking to the people and the message being passed from one to another. So often I in my late stage of hearing have to say what was that uh, and I get especially uh, gets really annoyed saying you come on get yourself a deaf aid it's uh, but, but, but uh, I'm, I'm always asking, um, you know, what, what, was, what, was, what was that? But that must have been going on. The message passed from crowd to crowd, uh, person to person in the crowd. And Moody preaching, Sankey singing, 
2,000 to 4,000 people? Well, um, but nevertheless, what they could do when the songs were sung was join in with the chorus. Now, things really only took off for them, oddly. I mean, they, 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 they'd begun in the United States, but they came to England. And uh, when they were here, 1872, it was a, a, a three-year journey, and they went to city after city, and the crowds grew and grew, and Moody would preach, and Sankey would sing. And it wasn't just the kind of folk who were used to gospel music, or the gospel being preached in that way. It was people of every kind of tradition, and also every social grouping, from Queen Victoria to the Prime Minister, William Gladstone at the time, um, who himself was a, what you call a high churchman. And Queen Victoria was certainly a very conservative church woman in terms of ecclesiastical tradition, ecclesial tradition, shall we call it. Um, nevertheless, this touched them. And uh, I'm bound to say that I think that uh, Sankey's music was probably the thing which gave them refreshment in the middle of all of Moody's words. It also gave Moody a chance to drink a glass of water or two and, and, and refresh that voice because it must have been really physically tiring from place to place to place to be going on in that way and, uh, and, um, uh, and, and trying to infuse the people. But the music did it. And of course, uh, when they got back to the States, the story had come. And so they then in Boston and in New York and in San Francisco and in even Vancouver in the United States, in Canada, these scenes were repeated and the audiences, uh, the, the, the people coming to listen and receive the gospel in this form grew and grew. And uh, probably one of the best known hymns at that time which was being sung by uh, Sankey to his own tune now, was there were 90 and 9 that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold, away on the mountains, wild and bare, away from the tender shepherd's care, away from the tender shepherd's care. Now, cleverly, uh, Fletcher has found uh, a, a little snippet of Sankey singing that in 1898 when he was um, in, in old age and, and his voice will sound rather scratchy but just and, and quite slow according to modern standards for a Moody and Sankey type hymn. Uh, nevertheless it gives you an insight into the way that Moody and Sankey just spent themselves all their resources, all their energies, everything they could do, all their gifts in this ministry, this gospel ministry, the evangel in words and music, appealing to so many and giving revival, refreshment. Hear this and don't be surprised because this is an old cylindrical phonograph type of, of recording and yet it takes us right back to the, the, the closing years of that, that uh, ministry, 1898, and let me look at the dates. Uh, yes, uh, Moody died in 1899 and Sankey in 1908. So they were at the, the latter stages then when Sankey sang this. Here you are. Oh, 
that linking us with a particular period of, of history, but uh, showing you the, the kind of revival song which caught on. I remember um, waking one morning in the guest house in Zanzibar, next to Zanzibar Cathedral, and hearing some uh, singing from the early morning Eucharist going on next door in the cathedral, very, very early in the morning. Uh, and I thought, I know that tune. And it was beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand, the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way, from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. That hymn and that the Sankey hymn tune is in the green uh, edition of the, the in English hymnal. I say this crossed all ecclesial boundaries and gave refreshment and revival. It wasn't the only way that they taught. Uh, Moody was keen on the wordless book, which meant a, a pattern of colours, which I think the Baptist preacher C.H. Spurgeon was the first to use, but it meant that people didn't have a script, but they looked at panels of colours on a chart or a banner and at first there were only three. It was black, red, white. Black represented the darkness of our human condition, all of us, globally, every culture, everything. That, that, that represented that. Red represented for us, if you want, the, the, the blood of Christ, the offering of God himself to save our human condition. And white was really like the, the robe of the pilgrim, having come to the journey's end and put on white. Uh, after that, M Moody added gold as the sign of the gates of, of the, the eternal city to which he was leading people. By then you had black, red, white, gold. Others then added blue after red for the baptism, which then became white. And finally, others added green, which, was the, which came after the white, as the growth in Christ that all that refreshment gave. Now, you can see how well that works, because uh, people, not just children, would relate to the colours, and the person would be given promptings as they partly told their own story and partly told the gospel stories, and so many of the hymns that were being sung were rooted in the gospel. And that meant that they could go seamlessly from one to the other, and there was a good memory of how that happened on the way through. Uh, and so this, this was always called the wordless book. Now you have to take account to the fact that in different cultures, different colours mean different things, and so people would tune it once they knew the, the culture they were in. But nevertheless, that message quite easily was given with the uh, memories being helped, not only by the music of the songs now, but also by the colours on the, on the wall. Easy ways of going on in this way. What I'm bound to say is that, that Sankey um, just wore himself out, wore his voice out, and in two further United Kingdom um, trips, he found himself having to go home early because he'd just worn himself out trying to get those songs over, but by then they were well known. So the crowds would sing the choruses with him and quite often the, 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 the whole song. And so it went on. Now, he lived on after Moody, but, but as Moody's health was failing, they had actually worked themselves completely to a standstill. As Moody's health was failing, Sankey's family took him on a pilgrimage to Egypt and Palestine. And there's a lovely story that when he got to Jerusalem, he insisted on climbing to the top of the Tower of David, in the citadel there, and it was in Ottoman Empire hands in those times, and the, a bemused Ottoman guard on the top saw this quite elderly man lift his eyes to heaven and sing Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the Lord, from whence cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord who hath made heaven and earth. Such a, a, a wonderful image of Sankey standing there in Jerusalem on the Tower of David, singing, and singing had been the way that David himself had quietened the terrible times of King Saul, and himself has passed on as not only the shepherd king, but the Lord's musician, and the basis of all our psalm singing and our music in worship. Let's say our prayers then on this particular day um, and uh, we are thinking today in our Anglican communion and praying for 
the Diocese of Capsabet in the Anglican Church of Kenya and pray for Archbishop Justin, pray for uh, Rose, Bishop of Dover, pray for Emma, Bishop at Lambeth, and here in the diocese today for the Church of Holy Trinity Margate and Clifford Stocking and John Huffman in their ministry there. So uh, we bring our own intentions, our own prayers from across the world and uh, we say the collect for today, the fifth Sunday before Lent. Almighty God, by whose grace alone we are accepted and called to your service, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit and make us worthy of our calling through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And together the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Moment now for your own reflection. The music of the harp is a, a, a live um, a piece of music which Mary Morley uh, was filmed doing in the cathedral itself. So you may hear noises of folk entering the cathedral at this act of worship. But here is the beautiful music of the harp.
The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love and those whom you will pray for, today and always. Amen. Well, enjoy your day. Uh, I shall have a fairly noisy afternoon, I think, because rugby starts again this afternoon. And England are playing Scotland in, uh, at Murrayfields in Edinburgh, so I shall have a very noisy Fletcher cheering, and I shall hear what's going on at that time. So, go well.